Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Nippon Life India Asset Management Limited Q3 FY22 Earnings Conference Call hosted by JM Financial. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Samir Bise from JM Financial. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Nirav. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining this call today. Uh, from Nippon Life uh, India Asset Management, we have the entire management team led by Mr. Sandeep Sikka. Uh, without wasting time, I would want to hand over the call to Mr. Sikka. Over to you, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Q3 FI22 Earnings Call Conference. We have with us our Chief Financial Officer, Pratik Jain, Chief Business Officer, Sagata Chatterjee, Chief Business Officer, Ashwin Dugal, Chief Digital Officer, <coughs> Atan Saha, Head of Elite Partner Client Group, Nitin Gupta, and Fujikake San, nominee from Nippon Life Insurance, Tokyo. Overall industry assets grew at an even pace in the quarter driven by rise in equity and passive segments while fixed income saw muted growth. Despite high equity market volatility, industry's steady performance was a result of continued interest by retail and HNS segments. The industry's unique investor grew by 15% in Q3 and crossed the 3, uh, 30 million mark. The strong growth in the investor base and the overall assets indicate confidence in long-term investors in mutual funds. We expect the industry to grow to maintain its growth momentum in future also. At Nippon India Mutual Fund, our priority is to be future ready and capture the long-term opportunity. As stated earlier, we are confident of regaining our market positioning as well as recreating and reinventing by continuously innovating and disrupting ourselves. Towards these goals, I'm happy to share our overall market share rose by 22 basis points in nine months, uh, the last nine months, to 7.34%. AUM increased by 32% to rupees um, 2,806 billion. This is a third sequential quarter of market share gains along with the improvement in other qualit qualitative parameters. We increased our share of industry unique investors to 33% with a base of 10 billion investors. Also, a share of industries B30 folios grew from 10.4% as on December 2020 to 11.6% as on December 2021. The growth was driven by improved fund performance, comprehensive product portfolio, enviable track record in pa passive segment, and robust risk management and granular distribution network. In line with our investor first philosophy, we keep expanding our product suite to cater to the investors' various varied needs and diversified demands. In Q3, we launched India's first fund focused on dynamic and growth opportunities uh, in Taiwanese market. The Taiwan Equity Fund raised 65,000 applications, including 6,000 HNIs and family offices. In Jan 22, uh, Jan 22, we completed the NFO of India's first auto ETF and silver ETF and silver. ETF fund of fund. Other such unique offerings in the pipeline include S&P, uh, EV index fund, the innovation fund, and artificial intelligence fund of fund. In total, we have filed 11 schemes for regulatory approvals. These products will provide investors with more value creative avenues to diversify risk and generate sustainable returns. Here, I would like to reiterate, reiterate that even in future, we will focus on strong asset growth, but never at the expense of profitability. Driven by keen retail focus, we have one of the largest retail AEMs in the industry at Rs. 776 billion. The contribution of retail AEM to total AEM is amongst the highest in the industry at 28% compared to 23% for the industry. We are amongst the market leaders in beyond 30 cities category. This category contributes an AEM of Rs. 488 billion. 18% of the total assets are sourced from these locations against the industry average of 17. As on December 31st, 2021, 70% of the individual, uh, individual assets have a vintage of more than 12 months. The annualized SIP transaction book is at Rs 82 billion. 
on a gross basis, the systematic folios rose by 385,000 um, in Q3. Our Systematic AUM rose by 38% to <coughs> Rs. 507 billion. 45% of our SIPs AUM has contributed, 45% uh, of our SIP AUM has continued for more than 5 years, reserves 20% for the industry. Also in the volatile markets, folios with low ticket size have demonstrated longer vintage and better stickiness. 12% of our SIP folios have continued for more than 5 years as an Eastern industry average of 8. Today, Nip, uh, Nippon India Mutual Fund offers the industry's best suits in passive products. The strong growth in industry's passive assets, our ETF ecosystem is already in a place and far ahead of the pairs in terms of investor base and mind share. In this segment, we manage AUM of Rs 515 billion and have a market share of 13%. Excluding the EPFO allocation which goes to two public sector mutual funds, we, have the, we are the largest ETF pair in the country. Our gold ETF is the biggest fund in the category with having assets in excess of Rs. 63 billion. Nippon India's share in industry ETF folio rose to 60%. In Q3, we added 1.6 million investors and accounted for 70% of the total ETF folio additions in the industry during this quarter. And a Nippon India mutual fund has 69% share of ETF volumes on both NSC and BSC. Our ETF average daily volume across key funds are far higher than the rest of the industry. As a well diversified asset management company, we have begun to grow our non mutual fund segments over years. Along with the government mandates, we manage assets of Rs. 6 and 7 billion in non mutual fund segment. The offshore business has assets of Rs. 115 billion under management and advisory. Leveraging Nippon Life's global network, we continue to ramp up our international presence. As mentioned earlier, Taiwan Equity Fund and other products are in uh, early, uh, Taiwan Equity Fund and other products which are in approval stage are a step in that direction. In our AIS business, we manage CAT 2 and CAT 3 AIS across asset classes. As on December 21, uh, Nippon India AIS has raised commitments of 42 billion across all funds. We have received IFSCA approval to carry out asset management operations in our gift city uh, uh, branch. By expanding our reach to, to unique locations, we expect to accelerate global allocation into India and add value to international investors and partners. Online and digital assets have become a strong source of investor ac uh, acquisition and communication. A strong digital acquisition and engagement framework with targeted performance oriented campaigns is driven through cutting edge tools like Adobe uh, Campaign Management. These initiatives have helped fuel consistent growth on our own storefront and various other conclaves. The focus is towards creating a digital experience that is friendly, futuristic, and frictionless for all our partners and investors. In Q3, digital platform contributed 58% of our total new purchase transactions. Over 750,000 purchases were executed through digital assets, an increase of 83%. Nippon India Mutual Fund has a well diversified and enable distribution base. As on December 2021, we have approximately 83,800 distributors and panel with us. The MFT base rose by over uh, 8,500 with an addition of 18, uh, 1,800 distributors during this quarter. Uh, also, we have ongoing tie-ups with 20 prominent digital partners. Direct digital uh, direct channel contributes 55% of the mutual fund AEM. On the distributed assets, share of NFTs was 58%. 88% of the distributed assets are contributed by individual investors. Nippon India Mutual Fund has a wide presence across 270 locations across the country. We continue to review our existing branch operations and future expansion plans. In recent quarters, our marketing efforts have increasingly focused on digital channels, which are more cost effective as in its offline advertising. Now on our financial performance. For the quarter ended December, uh, December 31st, 2021, profit after tax was rupees 1.7 billion. Operating profit increased by 48% to 2.1 billion. 
Operating profit as the ratio of average assets under management rose from 26 basis point in Q3 to 29 basis point in Q3 FY22. Our aim is to create sustainable value through growth across asset classes, cost optimization initiatives, resulting in expanding and favorable operating leverage. We continue to grow organically through our physical and online channels. Additionally, we remain open to evaluate investment in strategic opportunities that add to the profitability or complement our existing businesses. As a signatory to UNPRI, world's largest voluntary sustainability initiative, we aim to create sustainable future for our stakeholders by integrating ESG principles into our business operations, investment processes, and stewardship. By introducing formal policies, including case of fund management, we intend to share a strong and a clear message about the organization's purpose with our stakeholders. Also, as stewards of our investors' capital, we continuously engage and evaluate all, evaluate all our industry companies on their performance on issues related to sustainability, governance, and value creation for diverse stakeholders. To sum up, I would like to reiterate, at NAM India, investor centricity remains the key, the key theme. We strive to deliver a complete product suit customized to investor needs, superior fund performance, efficient client servicing based on comprehensive digital ecosystem. We are confident to continue our trend of profitable growth in coming quarters. With these comments, we are happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who wishes to ask a question, you may press star and 1. The first question is from the line of prayers, Shane. From Motilal Oswal, please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, there are three questions from my side. Uh, firstly, if I look at your uh, sequential AUM mix, there is a marginal improvement on the equity, uh, equity share, uh, but the yields have dropped. Uh, if I uh, you know, divide the revenue by the overall. So what is the reason for that? And could you give some understanding as to how the yields for the overall business could move going ahead? That would be my first question. Second, uh, is your sharp uh, fall in your other income? Uh, what is the reason for that? And what could be a sustainable long-term remedy for that? And lastly, on the other expenses, because well, you know, there has been a decent decline on other expenses. Uh, whether you know this is sustainable remedy. So, I'll request Patik to take the, uh, your three questions, please. Yeah, hi, Prayesh. Uh, so in terms of the yields, uh, you know, uh, what we've seen is that if you look at our average AEM uh, compared to the last year, uh, you know, what has happened is that our average AEM uh, is about 43% uh, up, uh, you know. So obviously one, because of the size issue, if you see most of this has been because of the Mark II market impact. So the size issue, the TR goes down, that is one. Two, there has been an increased competition and the NFOs, which is also as uh, you know, as pushed us to you know relook at some of the distribution uh, you know tie ups, uh, you know so large and the other, the the third part is that you know the change in the uh, you know the old assets getting replaced by the new assets. So these are the three key reasons wherein you know we have seen a marginal decline in our uh, equity realization, and the reason is that look if you see in the last uh, two quarters you know there has been slew of uh, uh, NFOs. And each one of them, you know, and especially from the new players uh, or rather the smaller players, which has gone and, you know, given very high kind of a distribution commission, uh, which has, uh, you know, sort of uh, created some kind of, a, I would say, uh, you know, in, uh, you know a, a tilt towards the, uh, you know, uh, or rather people focusing more on the business growth rather than the profitability. However, we remain focused. You know, we continue to focus on profitability, but on a tactical basis, we'll keep reviewing the tie-ups. And, uh, you know, while we'll keep growing the business, but our focus will remain on profitability. So that's on the yield part of it. Uh, on the other income side, uh, you know, you would recollect that uh, last quarter and, you know, earlier also we had mentioned that, you know, we have, uh, you know, pared down our uh, total exposure to equities. Uh, but yet, uh, you know, we, we have almost 10% of our total uh, asset under management or other the uh, net worth 
into uh, equities. So of the total assets what we have uh, or the total cash we have, 90% uh, of that is in our own uh, mutual fund and fixed deposits. Of that 10% is in uh, equities. So uh, you know pre prior quarter saw almost 10 to 12% increase. This, this quarter was actually a decline by 2%. So those mark to market impact you know have led to uh, the difference in the other income. There is no one time or there is no uh, I would say any aberration. This is all mark to market even and that happens you know on the last date of the month. Even if you see on the fixed income side there has been some yield elevation on the the you know fag end of the quarter which has also you know got mark to market and for that reason you know our other income is uh, you know uh, down as compared to the previous quarter. Coming to your other expenses part we have always been maintaining that look you know uh, close to about 45 to 50 odd crores would be a run rate to spend and you know we will be uh, you know there are expend which are uh, more towards uh, you know discretionary part uh, in terms of marketing and digital spend which we keep uh, you know uh, monitoring and you know depending on the activity levels you know, those are uh, you know semi variable so you will see you know this expense remain range bound and, and there is uh, you know again no uh, one off uh, kind of expenses there is just one thing that uh, you know the transitions uh, expenses which transitionary expenses which we were incurring uh, because moving out of the uh, the old architecture environment from the uh, previous parents have now completed and therefore you know some of the duplicacy of the expenses have come down. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, just on the yield part again, uh, while you mentioned that the three re the three reasons for the fall in yield, out of which I think the NFOs continue to be very you know priced aggressively or you know distribution commissions are given aggressively out there. Uh, the tier, the TER movement with regards to size, if the equity market you know come back to the growth trajectory, will continue to be, and so in a way, the directionally equity yields will continue to drop. Plus, over and above that, your ETFs, pair of ETFs will move higher. So, in that sense, is it fair to assume that the yields, which are uh, you know, will continue to decline from here as well in the next couple of years? Yeah, see, see, if you see the, if again, you know, from our perspective, if the assets, you know, have if grow almost like 45, 50%, then again, because of the size issue, you know, because of the regulatory size issue, you will, you will see some compression happening. And uh, so, you know, to that effect, there will be a compression you will likely to see, but that will be offset by the absolute growth uh, in terms of the overall fees. Okay. Got that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask the question. The next question is from the line of Mohit Sarana from CLSA India. Please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, uh, my first question is a continuation of previous question. You obviously said that, you know, as the size of uh, AUMs grow, there will be some kind of yield compression because of regulatory um, rules around that. But uh, in terms of NFOs, do you expect the current situation of uh, pricing, uh, you know, distributor uh, dis distributor commission very generously, you know, do you think that will have an impact uh, in FY23-24 as well, or do you see this as a transitionary kind of an impact? That's my first question. I think Sandeep, this is right. I think the way I see it, this is a transitionary thing. I think we have seen, you know, I think uh, some AMCs trying to filling up their portfolio by launching new schemes because there's also a constraint on how many now you cannot launch multiple schemes. I mean, uh, SEBI has already has a one scheme per category and you have seen some new AMCs coming into play. So I think I think this is a transitionary. I think I take it more, you know, I think from a long-term point of view, um, uh, I'm seeing more focus on profitability in this industry than ever before. So I think I have a uh, personal view. This is a transitionary thing and we'll set it down very soon. And even if you know this industry is all about volume, I think uh, a drop in one basis point yield, uh, um, one or two basis point can happen, cannot never be ruled out. But I think more than that can be compensated by increase in volume. I think and from our perspective, what we continue to focus on increasing volumes by getting better quality assets. And as I mentioned in my opening comments, the stickiness of the assets, smaller ticket size, I think all these things are going to play an important role because markets will remain volatile. I think so that I think as we play through the different market cycles, the stickiness of the assets uh, is going to be more important than just the AUM. And I think our focus remains on that. 
Got it. And so the second question is around ETFs and index funds. Obviously, you have a lot of uh, index funds in pipeline. So uh, I just wanted to understand uh, in terms of uh, your uh, contribution to bottom line, how how should we look at it in terms of your, you know your uh, strategic plan to grow into ETFs and passives? How should it incrementally contribute to the bottom line? So I think from our perspective, I think for, I'll just give you a directional view how we see and then Pratik will answer about the uh, penal aspect. I think from our perspective, I think we've always believed our philosophy is investor first. I think uh, we uh, clearly believe whatever is good for the investor is good and uh, is good for the AMC and the entire ecosystem and we need to keep offering. I think we have clearly seen there has been a shift towards uh, um, the ETFs and index. And I think we've been, you know, we were able to catch the, if you were to go to uh, slide number 18 of our presentation uh, and that will tell you our uh, position where we stand where we are almost 70 to 80 percent of the volumes of the stock exchange and unlike mutual funds where normally investors like to diversify into four or five different schemes in ETF there is no need for an investor to diversify into multiple ETFs because I think the underline is the same so I think there is going to be a first mover advantage that we have and we will enjoy from our point of view I think we broadly net uh, we think we are um, having an, um, the realization of about 9 to 10 basis point. Uh, and I think on a total, uh, uh, our today ETF books, uh, total book is about on maybe 50,000 crores. Uh, 50,000 crores, so accordingly about 50 crores is very contributed to the bottom line because of that. Okay. So you, you, uh, are there no uh, additional expenses related to ETFs and index funds? So I think from our perspective, uh, broadly, I think the ecosystem that we have built up, I think today, uh, any new launch does not, you know, I think uh, lead to any incremental cost for us. You know. It's negligible, nothing worth talking. Sure, sure. Thanks a lot for your experience. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Amit Nanavati from Namora. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, question on uh, OPEX again. Uh, basically, if I look at just the quarterly run rate of non-employee, non-brokerage uh, kind of expense, purely overheads, uh, we've been clocking around 50 to 53 crores odd. Uh, this is roughly 10% lower than last year. And if I look at pre-COVID run rate, uh, this used to be around 70 crores, right? So it's a decent improvement that you've seen here in addition to uh, cost rationalization on the employee cost as well. Uh, but if you can just uh, qualitatively, uh, you know, uh, indicate towards uh, which segments or uh, what heads are seeing uh, rationalization in cost and how uh, can this trajectory be maintained or uh, these are like one-off cuts and which uh, more or less as kind of bottomed out. No, so Amit, if you recollect, uh, almost 12 quarter back, uh, you know, we had a lot of questions around our higher uh, OPEXs compared to some of our industry peers. And there about, you know, we started deeply looking into, uh, you know, uh, all of the each individual line item expenses. And, uh, you know, if you, rec if you recall uh, two quarter back, I mentioned that, look, we have now reached to a steady state with 10% plus and minus, uh, because most of these costs are uh, broadly fixed in nature. Some of them are semi-variable and some are discretionary. Uh, so large part of this cost of uh, that 50 crore, what we talk about, almost 70% is uh, broadly considered as a fixed and semi-variable, uh, where you know these costs will continue. There is still some discretionary cost which we have, which we uh, you know basis uh, the transaction volume, basis the activities. Uh, you know, uh, those uh, expenses keep uh, moving up or down. And also, again, as mentioned, to be future ready, you know, we keep engaging into expenses related to, uh, you know, uh, either digital or uh, marketing. Uh, you know, so these are some discretionary spend which we'll keep depending on the market environment, depending on, you know, if we come out with a new fund offering, et cetera. Obviously, there is there will be some elevated spend towards that. So that discretionary element will remain. But barring that, if you see, uh, you know, this, uh, these expenses by far will remain in the range bound in, you know, around this numbers. 
and which if you look at the last eight quarters you know this has been around this and you know these numbers only yeah so basically uh, would it be largely marketing spend cuts that we would have done uh, rent may not go down as sharply uh, uh, other heads would be smaller right so it's uh, largely uh, marketing and advertisement where we would have seen large cuts or it will be some other segment no so it was if you see uh, from the past it was across you know we had lot of uh, these uh, service providers which we have gone and renegotiated cost with them some of them we have changed uh, you know and some of the other establishment cost which we were incurring we have actually gone to uh, you know like you take the example of our own head office you know we have now moved to uh, you know a smaller location so uh, you know so uh, and then we have got consolidated everything our it under one umbrella under ibm so we have done quite a bit uh, in terms of rationalization of our uh, third party spend on the uh, spend which were related to uh, you know of course travel convenience and others have also come down because of the covid uh, of course and uh, in terms of marketing also you know earlier we used to spend more on the uh, offline media now uh, the online media is comparatively cheaper so you know it's a slew of changes not just marketing it is across board you know we have uh, you know looked at each and every spend and that we started almost uh, 12 quarters back and in the last five or six quarters you know we have been into some kind of a steady state expenses you will see plus minus 10% uh, in a quarter on quarter this was due to the discretionary spends got it got it uh, secondly on the uh, eum side right uh, uh, one larger drag on the yield also is because your uh, 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 upfront plus trail eum kind of uh, getting replaced by a full trail model as well right uh where are we in that process it's already 2 3 years now right since the regulations changed uh so would it be fair to assume large part of the aum which needs to get replaced uh is by and large replaced obviously there will be some sticky aum which will take longer to get replaced but by and large yeah so if you see you know like uh, you know unfortunately uh, for us uh, you know we, for a large part of the last 2 3 years post the regulatory changes you know we have seen uh, you know uh, quite uh, you know quite a fund outflow which has happened earlier because of our transition issues and later on because of the performance issue but now with the performance coming back and uh, 10 uh, like the top 10 uh, of our uh, schemes now under that uh, you know quartile 1 i think we believe that uh, you know this outflow is more or less over and you know that this asset getting replaced also there is a fatigue factor coming in from a re- uh, you know outflow uh, you know because most of the money which was to go out has already gone out so if you that for if you see uh, our uh, market share stabilizing now in year and with the improved performance we likely to see more inflow coming in and uh, so the asset replacement which is causing this drag which is not likely to be there but yes the asset replacement drag may not be there but the new asset which is only the trail definitely that will keep pressure or putting pressure on the yields yeah which is fine at least it uh, is that will be only on the new incremental one as come to the yield you know the amount which gets outflow it, it has a you know a much larger impact because that was you know upfront plus trail and the new one which is coming is only on trail got it got it lastly if you can just quantify the yield in the equity segment that you are making now uh, so we do not give uh, you know specific yields asset wise uh, but it's been uh, you know it has uh, declined uh, you know uh, over the uh, you know last few quarters and as i mentioned to you broadly because of the three reasons one the increase in size you know from 80000 if you see for the last uh, you know quarter uh, comparative quarter to one like 20000 so that has been one uh, second of course replacement of the old assets and third of course because of the uh, you know the current new environment where a fund is coming you know through largely through the new nfos etc where you know where uh, competition has been getting very high distribution cost so all three reasons have played out and you know we have seen some compression on our equity yields thank you sorry to interrupt you amit i'll request you to come back in the question queue for a follow up question i request all the participants please restrict to two questions per participant if time permit please come back in the question queue for a follow up question The next question is from the line of Sage Mitchell from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good evening. 
so so my uh, first question was around our equity uh, equity market share loss which has still uh, persisted even in q3 so if you could highlight you know what is causing this uh, loss uh, is it performance or is it uh, is it flows what is the pro problem we are facing and the second one was around if you could quantify the nfo expense line item for q3 and maybe q2 to understand such a sharp decline in uh, such a sharp improvement in our other expenses and third was around you know if you could explain us you know what is the concentration of your ifa sourcing to your equity aum to understand what are these new ifas bringing to the table in terms of aum or, or the flows yeah those would be my suggestions uh, i'll take the uh, uh, sandeep this i'll take the first question on the equity market share I think uh, our overall market share has stabilized, and as you can see in the last three quarters, overall uh, AMC market share has gone up by 22 basis points. Uh, equity still continues its winner as a minor dip. I think one of the reasons for that, uh, while we have started seeing new flows coming in, uh, a lot of flows which are coming in the industry are also a function of the SIPs which were started in the last two, three years. The last two, three years, as you're aware, we had a little bit challenge in equity performance. That performance has been uh, very good now. The new flows have started. So, and also, if you can see, over the last three quarters, our SIP numbers have started going up. So, effectively, there will be a positive lag effect, and uh, a lot of new SIPs which are getting registered, I think uh, that will help us to increase our market share. The present flow that is coming are the SIPs which are registered last two, three years, where we did not get a market share. Uh, but directionally, I think we are happy. I think the new flows and the new SIPs have been increasing. So that, that is number one. I think the other question, Pratik, on the NFO. Yeah. So from the NFO perspective, there are no specific costs related to NFOs. Uh, you know, so I could not get your question. So there are no, uh, uh, you know, NFO costs these days, you know, which we have to incur. The, the only thing one could be that, look, uh, if some spend has been done on the advertisement basis, otherwise there are no specific NFO expenses. Uh, which were incurred in the previous quarter as compared to this quarter. Yeah, so my question was around the marketing expenses uh, specific to the NFO, which we have done. So those wouldn't be that material. Uh, so, so, so overall, if you see the expense here, as I mentioned to you that, look, this is this uh, expense line item has been range bound plus or minus 10% here and there. And if you see, uh, you know, of course, uh, there is, uh, you know, in previous uh, quarter, we had one uh, large, uh, you know, offering, uh, which was there uh, in terms of our uh, uh, flexica fund. So, uh, but, uh, you know, so there could be some impact of that marketing spend which we have done higher. But, uh, you know, but that is not very significant, you know, to talk about because overall spend has not been, uh, you know, changed uh, dramatically. So, for, as against the 42 crore, uh, this quarter, this was last year 45 crore. I think, and your final question on uh, the mix. Mm -hmm. Uh, through the ISAs and distributors, that's on slide number 27 of the investor presentation. The detailed breakup is there. Uh, and just to follow up, so, so uh, uh, against this 42 crores, you say, uh, say that uh, for the last part of this number would look like uh, 45 crores. Uh, is that right? So Q3, other expenses. See, if you go to the detail of the consolidated numbers, what we have presented, uh, so if you, uh, the uh, other expenses which account for uh, 42 crores in Q3 was 45 crore last year, last quarter. Why, oh, why? And uh, 49 crore, uh, sorry, 49 crore last quarter and uh, 45 crores in Q3 21. Good. And, and some color around our fund performance, whether there has been some change in the strategy or or how uh, how is uh, the earlier, how are the earlier strategies panning out for us? Uh, some color around that? No, I think it's a, uh, the, we have uh, had a, a new risk framework that we have implemented. So I think uh, leveraging on our uh, research and a new risk framework that has been implemented working closely with Nippon Life from Japan also. I think a lot of things have been, uh, so it's a, uh, it's a proprietary tool from Nippon that we are trying to use. So it has helped us. So it's a both mix of art and science and trying to have a, a better risk framework. So I think we'll not be able to, you know, go too much into detail for that. But I think ever since it's been implemented, uh, it, um, and along with a strong research capability, uh, fund performance has stabilized. Got it. Uh, thanks for this. Thank you. The next question is from the man of Akshay Jogani from Exponent Tribe. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. 
I had a, I had a little bit of a big picture question. Uh, if, if you kind of uh, take two steps back and think about how how the industry structure has evolved, uh, would you would you would you kind of talk about the power balance between distribution companies and manufacturing? Right? How has uh, that changed over the last four, five years according to your and where do you see that going? Uh, one of the reasons that I asked this question is that you spoke about how the current spike in uh, permissions that, that the distribution companies are getting is transitory and from the way I see it, uh, it, it may not be because you know uh, on the manufacturing side there is a far more number of companies that are entering and they seem to have a different positioning and all will likely be building the same distribution channel, right? So we need to sort of get your thoughts on uh, how it has moved and where you keep going. I think it's very difficult to answer this question. I think uh, all stakeholders, I think, uh, are jointly working towards the growth of the industry. And uh, your question on power, I do not know what do you mean by power, you know, equation, you know. Uh, but I think broadly, I think it is anybody, whether it's uh, a distributor, advisor, MFD, or a manufacturer, everybody has to do, uh, add value to the investor. Uh, and uh, secondly, you know, it will all depend on the, uh, coming back to the question on manufacturers, it will depend on different manufacturers. What is the strategy? If somebody who is working for a growth and top line could have a very different strategy. I think as we have articulated uh, in past also in my earlier comments, I think we will be focusing. Broadly, our focus will remain on profitable growth and we will not mind walking away from business that does not leave anything on the table. Sure, sure. Only, only if, I, if I may kind of, uh, kind of follow up here. Uh, what I meant is that uh, uh, that that uh, if you see the the realizations of the asset management companies are are sort of getting compressed, uh, right? The, uh, uh, it is not the compression is not at on the same same level uh, among the companies that are actually distributing the products, right? And, and which which the, the, so so that kind of seems to suggest that uh, that they they seem to be able to price uh, get the, get a better pricing for what they do. Is that a fair assessment? I don't think so because there are not uh, that data may or may not be available. I mean, uh, as uh, transparently, you know. But I think the way mm -hmm. I see it, I think we have very clearly, I think mentioned in past, there can definitely, and Pratik also mentioned, there can definitely be a compression analyzation that could be where the competition, mm -hmm. whether it could be uh, what what you call distributor power, or whether it could be because of uh, the investor, you know, or could be because of regulator. I think what we have to see is how are we building up our ecosystem to mm. do the same business at a lower cost. Mm. Uh, how are we building up reach to go uh, deep um, uh, into, you know, Bharat. And I think your question, you know, on I think where every manufacturer who will come will go to the same distributor, that necessarily may not be true. It depends basically. Mm. I think if you have a long-term vision today, I think we are one of the few bank, non-bank based that asset management companies, the kind of granular reach that we have built up and we, we commented on a B30 strategy. Uh, mm. So I think we, uh, I think it's, uh, 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 it's about building up a granular business, I think working closely with distributor and keeping investor in mind in the center. I think that is the key. Sure. I think it is not about sharing or the, our fees or what we are sharing. I think as long as we keep adding value, all of us keep adding value to the investor, uh, I think sure. we clearly see there's enough uh, juice available for everybody. Definitely. The second question is on ETF economics. So uh, just me if I heard it wrong, uh, I heard that realization at the revenue level was about nine to ten basis points. Is that is that correct? Sorry. Uh, ETF economics. You said that you make realizations of about ten basis points. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, we make uh, net, including the uh, C the government mandates. You know, we make about ten basis points if we remove the. The government, the CPSC part of it, our uh, realization is about 13 to 14 basis point net of all expenses. Sure. Okay, so this is the operating uh, earnings realization. Sorry? This is the profitable, profit realization. Yes, yes, yes. See, besides, that, besides that, there is just, uh, you know, the employee related cost, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the small team, uh, what we have to which runs the ETF. Because sure. see, we have a common distribution team. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we have few employees which are dedicated to ETF, which is, uh, you know, on the fund management and the product side. And then, of course, uh, you know, we have a separate dealer. So, you know, those small team, you know, that is a separate sure. cost which is for running the ETF. The rest all is uh, same. Sure. So is it fair to fair to uh, assume that, let's say, the 50,000 crore goes to uh, 1 lakh crore, then the whole incremental uh, is 10, 12, 13 percent yield to be slowed down to operating earnings? 
Yeah, yeah. So entirely, you see, yeah. whatever expense, see, all our expenses, what we charge to ETF are available. Of that, if you remove the two basis point uh, and another one or two basis point on top of other expenses, then it becomes our net yield and which is directly adding up to our uh, profitability because obviously we would, you know, if this amount becomes 50 to 1 lakh or 1 lakh to 2 lakh, we would not need, uh, you know, more number of people, uh, you know, so there is no incremental fixed infrastructure or employee cost associated with it. Great. Thank you so much. This is super helpful. Since on ETF, I'd also like to add, yeah. I think unlike other assets, you know, with the liquid funds mm -hmm. and all, because the air expense is not, the, more than the expense, the traded volume is more important. Because mm -hmm. if the volume is not there, uh, mm -hmm. the impact cost uh, leads to, you know, negative carry for the investor. So I think, uh, and the fact that we have the highest volumes in the stock exchange actually puts us in a very comfortable position. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Akshay. I'll request you to come back in the question queue. Participants, please register to do questions for participant. If time permits, please come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. The next question is from the line of the Panjan Ghosh from Korak Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, two questions from my side. Uh, one is I was looking into your uh, individual equity market share uh, broken up into channels, direct and uh, regular. And it seems that in B30 cities, your market share on equity uh, portion for the individual segment has almost, in the direct channel has almost uh, declined by 600, 550, 600 basis points, much higher than uh, declining across other channels or overall for the company on the equity side. So just wanted to get some color on that. And on the second question, uh, you, if you can shed some light on, you know, how the customer journey changes between, let's say, uh, 10 years back when they used to go through the direct, uh, through the broker channel or even today, versus when they come through some of the newer fintech sort of channels or the direct channel, and uh, does that indicate that performance as a parameter gradually becomes more and more uh, important to track? Um, that's all from my side. So I'll take the second question first. I think we'll come back to the data. I think uh, the customer, I think whether it's coming through a uh, conventional distributor, IFA, bank, or a fintech, I think performance has and remains as an important parameter. Uh, I think having said that, Allah, but uh, performance neither was and neither will be the only sole parameter because I think that ultimately it's going to be the brand, it's going to be the overall customer service. And also there is a realization today that I think it's uh, uh, performance. I think consistency of performance is more important rather than performance for that one year for at that point of time. So I think we have seen, as in to your question, over the last 10 years, investors, irrespective of which channel they are coming, they are evolving. Investors are deciding which five, six funds they want to invest. They pick up the funds. And it is not necessarily based on the uh, fund, only one parameter that is last 12 month performance, but it's the more consistency of performance along with the brand, service, uh, local servicing, multiple things. And that's exactly the reason I think if you see from our perspective, we continue having a very strong uh, network of 270 branches, 80, 85,000 distributors, and at the same time, uh, keep investing in a digital ecosystem where we are doing almost 58% 50, 50 of our new purchases are coming through that. So I think performance remains, uh, remain, uh, was and remains important, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's a, a complete ecosystem around it. But the one big change is people like to see consistency in performance rather than just a spark, uh, a flash in the pan. Sure. Yeah. And that's elaborate. Maybe on the first question, you know, your uh, sharp decline in market share for individual equity segment through the direct channel in B30. Yeah, so uh, see, you know, again, you know, the B30 more has been towards the uh, equity flow. And, and you know, in, as I mentioned in the past that uh, in my earlier conversation that, look, we have been, uh, you know, lagging in terms of our overall uh, equity sales, uh, you know, which will come with a lag effect because, you know, obviously last two, three years have not been so good uh, because of the transition as well as the fund performance. But if you look at the last six to nine months, you know, the performance has come back sharply and most of our funds are now doing good. And, uh, you know, so the flows will come with a lag effect. So that's how, you know, you'll see that, you know, whatever we have seen the decline over a period of time, we're likely to recover this. But still, I would say that, look, our contribution from B30 locations still remain at 17.5% as compared to 166 of the industry. So, so, uh, so just to interrupt, I think I was asking more from the differential between direct and regular in B30. So the market share losses seems to be more profound in the direct channels. So I think that's what I was, you know, kind of trying to understand. 
No, again, that is, see, direct is even more profound because of the performance. See, you know that, look, a guy who's, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, because there is no, uh, you know, they are looking at a very near-term performances, uh, you know, when they are investing, and especially for last two, uh, you know, last two years, if you look at in the COVID, people who have been investing direct are more because of the fact that, uh, you know, where the performance have been, they've been investing into those schemes through uh, various partner uh, websites. And uh, there, you know, are probably our uh, schemes are not featuring. Uh, we understand that, but now if you look at most of the partners, RIAs, etc., you know, our performance uh, have been featuring in, uh, you know, in any of the uh, competition matrices, you know, uh, our schemes are featuring there. So obviously we see that, look, we'll be able to recoup uh, much of the market share loss over there. I think the way we have seen the change in trend in overall AUM, I think we are confident. I think over the next few quarters, equity will also market share, will uh, we'll be able to regain the market share. Definitely. Uh, thanks and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Sarah from Jeffries India. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. So several of my questions have been answered, sir. Just a few of them remain. So if you can just help me understand on the NFO part, I mean, how much uh, money did we raise in this quarter in NFO, if possible, to break out across different uh, uh, launches? And secondly, if I see on the industry NFO uh, 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 traction, so clearly there has been a sharp dip. So 2Q was very, uh, means high on NFO mobilization and 3Q kind of came down. So are you expecting or seeing some kind of NFO fatigue which is setting in or do we still expect that the kind of NFO momentum we have seen across industry that is going to persist for uh, at least next few quarters? Uh, so that was on NFO. And also if you can help me understand, is there any uh, product gap in the core equity uh, offering that we wish to do apart from the ETFs that are lined up. So this is my question, sir. And one more that I'll follow up later. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Okay. As far as the NFOs are yeah. concerned, yeah. Yeah. As, far as, the NFOs are concerned, as we mentioned, I think in our presentation, we did one uh, one fund. Uh, this, uh, which was again uh, a unique product offering. And before this, we had done the uh, flexi cap. I think from our perspective, we do not uh, see any major uh, NFOs coming up from our side. Uh, we will continue filling up our product suite uh, by coming out with unique products. And I think a lot of these products that will come, we will not like to go for uh, mega NFOs uh, for two reasons which I'll try to address after this. But I think we are, one of the key thing is going to be we'll continue to, uh, completing our product suite and let the investors and the advisors decide as and when they need. So example, the, in the Q2, we launched our um, uh, uh, IT ETF, uh, now I think auto ETF, uh, silver F fund of fund, um, electric vehicle um, fund is coming, Europe fund is coming, you know, I mean, there are a couple of things that we'll keep launching and our objective will not be to come out with one mega fund. Uh, the reason why I say this, you know, I think we clearly believe, I think uh, we do not want too many invest, uh, first, I think, go aggressive in pricing and try to raise a lot of money. Uh, I think we believe, I think, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, it has to be profitable for us. And we, I think, we'll prefer uh, seeing investors coming over a longer period of time rather than getting from a risk management point of view, getting uh, half a million from investors in 10 days and all these investors ride the same cycle. Uh, so I think from our perspective, as a uh, better risk management, we like to see investors coming over a longer period of time rather than just an NF NFO. So I, while from the industry point of view, I will not be able to comment too much whether the fatigue is there or not. But from our side, you will not see any mega NFOs. I think we like to go with the steady, uh, steady growth going forward. So, uh, and also, if you can just touch upon me, how much were we able to raise in this quarter through NFO route? So, uh, as mentioned by Sandeep, that look, uh, you know, we are in a race of non-NFO. We just did uh, one NFO last quarter, which was the Taiwan fund, and we raised about 620 odd crores. So, last quarter was only one NFO, which was Taiwan fund. And prior to that, uh, you know, that quarter, we, we had uh, two funds. Uh, one was on the uh, ETF side, and one was the uh, FlexiCap fund. So there, we, the uh, previous quarter, we raised about 3,800 odd crores. Uh, the last quarter, we raised about 620 crores. But see, the important point which Sandeep, uh, you know, did mention that, look, you know, we do not want to grow too much of assets, you know, unless there is a unique uh, product which we want to offer to our investor as an investor first philosophy. It is not that we go for a me too kind of a product and launching large NFOs. 
Sure. Uh, th- thanks, Pratik. That's quite helpful. Lastly, on just one bit on the interest rate side. So, given that interest rates are expected to go up uh, across the board, means what effect do we see uh, for our uh, debt funds? So, debt funds had a very good uh, inflows uh, in FY21, but after that, it kind of uh, petered out for the whole sector. And uh, can we expect that this year? Uh, means w- w- what is your outlook for the debt fund flows, given that interest rates will be on a rise? And secondly, what that could mean for our other income pool, which has been a bit volatile. So going ahead, uh, means the mark-to-market impact that you also referred to it the, during the early part of the uh, presentation. So could we uh, kind of be building in uh, uh, that kind of impact further in FY23? But I'll request mm-hmm. Ashwin Dugal, the same coach and the business officer, to take the first part, which is our portfolio for the investors. Ashwin. Uh, thanks, Sandeep. And uh, I, this is Ashwin here. Just to uh, answer the first part of the question relating to, you know, the uh, likely interest rate scenario which is standing out for the market. Uh, I think we, you know, our portfolios, you know, as Sandeep and Pradeek have mentioned, we have now a full suite of products, both on fixed income and inequity. And uh, as we go along for the next quarter at least, uh, you know, we see most of these flows coming in at, uh, you know, at the shorter end of the curve. Okay, and that has been the case. Uh, over the last, uh, you know, I would say about uh, uh, two quarters, where, uh, you know, the uh, the expectation had been that, uh, you know, the central bank action, et cetera, would lead to, uh, you know, eventual, uh, you know, hike in interest rates and withdrawal of liquidity. Hence, we've already seen over the last two quarters, the bulk of these uh, flows coming into the liquid and ultra short-term categories. However, there is another uh, segment of funds which is largely rolled down products within that three to five year uh, bucket, both on uh, ETS as well as uh, you know some of the actively managed funds which have been repositioned in that space. So therein we are seeing uh, 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 you know some money which is coming in purely because it provides the investor visibility of uh, returns for the period that they are invested in, been invested for. So uh, from that point of view, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, we are fairly well positioned to capture any, uh, uh, you know, cycle, uh, you know, on the, on the fixed income side, uh, you know, and uh, be it at the longer end or uh, at the shorter end, uh, and we have that full suite of products. On the realization thereof, you know, how it could impact, I'd ask Pratik to uh, uh, shed some light. I think, uh, you know, obviously we have seen that, uh, you know, in many of our funds, you know, given that our, how our performance has been and how the portfolio construct has been, you know, we have been marginally been improved uh, our, you know, realization. And also we expect that, uh, you know, while there could be, uh, you know, from, uh, because most of our portfolios was constructed in the recent times and, you know, and uh, they were at a lower yield. And hence, uh, we do not see any uh, compression coming in, but once, uh, you know, the net yields uh, for the investor keeps going up, you know, there will be a propensity for us to charge more. So obviously, uh, it will be interesting to see uh, from second quarter Q, Q uh, FY23, you know, we may see, uh, you know, because right now the debt yields are at one of, at one of the lowest. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it goes up, then probably, you know, uh, from our perspective, we will be able to charge slightly higher expenses uh, from third quarter FY23. Thanks a lot, Pratik. Thanks, Ashwin. Thanks, Sandeep. Great. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Prayesh Jain from Moti Lawaswal Financial Service. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that follow-up again. Uh, firstly, on the fintechs, you know, the kind of scale-up we've seen these fintechs, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of distribution. Um, so what, what is the size that Nippon would have these? And uh, secondly, uh, in your know, Non MF business, what will be the revenue contribution, EBITDA, and PAT contribution from the non MF business? I think regarding the fintechs, you know, and Arpan, uh, uh, Arpan, Chief Digital Officer, and the question to take this question, and then I will come back to Pratik. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, uh, so see on the, uh, can, you, can you repeat uh, what on the fintechs? What was the exact point on the fintechs, please? 
So the size of the fintech uh, has been growing in terms of distribution. Sure. So where are we in terms of market share? What kind of tie-ups do we have with these fintechs who are distributing? And uh, for the scale of possibilities on that side. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, what we do with the fintechs is what we have done with the fintechs is, is where we have been able to give them a complete uh, digital ecosystem where ha they have been able to integrate with us. I think uh, uh, what, what really matters in this uh, uh, digital uh, architecture is on how quickly and efficiently can you build a very agile ecosystem which can be uh, permeable as per the various users or journeys that uh, various fintechs might have for their customer journeys. I think Nippon leads in that. Uh, we are always the first point of contact for any potential fintech in this country uh, where they would want, want us to help them handhold in getting into this entire scenario. Once we are into business with them, we have seen that we always feature in the top five of being able to uh, attract investors. And, and that has been uh, because of our uh, exciting um, uh, digital chatting. And of course, our you know, product performance and other factors, which my colleagues were uh, talking about. Uh, so uh, yes, on the FinTech piece, uh, you know, Nippon is uh, probably one of the top picks uh, for any existing and new FinTech uh, who, who wants to get into the mutual fund space. OK. And uh, any, any you want to quote out there as to what kind of size is the fintech industry and how much? What would be the market share of Nippon there? You know, if you look at the if you look at the fintech industry right now, the entire AUM is is one percent of the overall industry AUM. So on the AUM piece, it is it is negligible. But what it is doing is it is opening up the market and helping a lot of millennial customers coming into uh, the the mutual fund industry fold, which itself is very very you know uh, welcome. As I said, you know, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on, on our share piece, we are on the top five across any fintechs uh, in, in this country. So just to add to it, if you were to look at it, uh, a lot of fintechs, like in mutual fund right now, still fintechs have been small. Uh, but I think you've seen, especially in the broking side, fintechs have done a great job. You know, I think they've been able to get a lot of new investors, new demand. If now you were to marry that with the increase in our own ETF investors, uh, that tells you the story. So I think we have a well-integrated uh, e API ecosystem. I think integrated with majority of the fintechs, which is not only related to uh, uh, the ones into wealth management and mutual fund, but also into the Indian capital markets. So I would attribute a lot of increase in our investor base, which has happened in the last 18 months in ETF due to the fintech integration. Yes. Um, and on the, my second question on the non-mutual fund uh, revenue, EBITDA and PAT contribution. Yeah, so uh, we make almost about 100 odd crores, uh, you know, on the non-mutual fund uh, businesses, uh, and uh, you know, almost 50% uh, would be the net profit on that. Okay, great, great. And lastly, just slipping in one more, what is the plans of utilization of the cash? Any further developments that you can talk about? Well, I think we continue exploring uh, options. You know, both uh, as I mentioned in my earlier address. You know. Uh, organic and inorganic, uh, organic and inorganic uh, opportunities. Uh, that is number one. But I think for us, the key thing is that it should be accredited to the shareholders. Number A. I think, and we are not only talking of acquisition of uh, an, another management company or something. I think we uh, remain open to invest into companies uh, which can help us increase our ROE uh, in, our, in our entire operations. See, if you were to look at it, we are doing um, almost. Uh, 50 million uh, million in the transactions, you know, uh, per annum. Uh, there are a lot of things, you know, where I think we can it's, uh, uh, we can uh, we see opportunities of investing, which can help us increase our ROE. So whether it's uh, or uh, asset management company or anything else, any other company which can uh, help us increase our ROE, that is our approach. And I think we continue to keep evaluating, and whenever there's something concrete, uh, I think one of the calls will come and share with you. Good. Thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you very much. As of no further questions, I will now hand the conference over to Mr. Samir Vise for closing comments. Thank you everyone for joining this call today and thank you to the team of uh, Nippon Life India Asset Management 
for giving us this opportunity to host the call. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. On behalf of JM Financial, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines.